Hi, Jimmy here, basking in the early evening light of a crisp autumn day in a graveyard with a cat, a couple of squirrels and I think a beehive possibly over there, but I could be lying. Um, so before we go any further with this video about early medieval administrative areas and boundaries in Wales, I'm going to adjust my exposure settings slightly um, so that I don't look quite as gloomy. There we go. And say um, that uh, I appreciate all of my patrons. You're all amazing. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry I haven't been posting as much lately. Uh, it's been a tough time. I will do a little catch up video soon about why it's been a tough time. Um, but thank you so much to everybody who sent me lovely emails and letters and notes and messages and stuff, making sure I'm okay, checking them on me. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to you all. And let's talk about Cantrevi. <laughs> So I find systems of uh, delineation fascinating. Uh, I went up to Hadrian's Wall at the weekend and it was great and I love the landscape archaeology of Hadrian's Wall and fortresses, um, ditches and ramparts, all that kind of jazz. I think it's amazing. I love it. I love that we can still see it after 2000 years and I threatened a couple of weeks ago to do a video about uh, medieval Welsh administrative systems and here is one of them. So you're going to learn two new words today unless you already know them in which case you're not going to learn any new words but uh, the words you're going to learn are two Geiria Cymraeg, Geir Un, Cantref, Geir Dai, Cwmwd. Geir Un, Cantref is similar to the concept of a hundred in English and Norman and Ukrainian and various other places, um, land registry law. And the concept of a cantrev is the concept of 100 settlements. And it's a very old system. It's been in place for well over ooh, 13, 1400 years um, in Wales. The system has existed for that long or been known for that long. Uh, it's not used so much now, but we'll get into that. Originally, the system probably related to a hundred farms, so a hundred um, individual farmsteads with extended families of in, living in them. So, you know, 20 or 30 people times a hundred is a, a couple of thousand people, um, which is a good chunk of humanity to administer when the quickest you can do is, is horseback riding. Uh, makes sense, nice and easy to, to manage, a useful number of people for a fight, uh, you can gather that many people with a couple of a couple of messengers um, and they'll be able to produce food for taxation purposes and that kind of stuff. Um, as time goes on and as we get into things like the sub-Roman and early medieval period, once the, the Romans leave, we start to see the system developing slightly more, where a cantrev will still be a hundred or thereabouts villages and within that system you see the system of kamutai developing. And kamutai is the plural, kumud is the singular. Uh, one kumud, two kamutai. Um, well, in kumud, tai kumud, tai o kamutai. Kamraik. Yeah, it's more flexible, isn't it? Anyway, um, Johnny. Cantrevi. Um, a cantrev in the early medieval period, so in the Viking Age, say, was um, under the control, under the administrative control of a noble or royal, not a king, unless it was the king's cantrev, and would have its own court. So the system of, of courts in Wales depended on the cantrevi, and the cantrevi depended on their courts. So you have a cantrev system where every hundred, basically every cantrev, has a court made up of ichelwyr, high men, um, nobles, effectively, of the area. And these will be minor royals, they'll be relatives, um, they might have risen through the ranks if they were extremely lucky um, and gained favour with their, with their king or their prince or their lord, and they dispense justice. They they uh, sort out criminal proceedings using, by the 19th and 10th centuries, the, the um, 
Cyfraith Howell, the laws of Howell Dda, Howell the Good, uh, who codified uh, Brythonic law, Welsh law, the law of the Britons, and they sort out boundary claims, compensation claims, fraud, um, property damage, theft, uh, personal injury claims. Uh, it was effectively it was a small claims court. It was a, it was a magistrate's court, and the system worked quite well. In fact, the system worked well enough um, that Cantrevi was still being used in the later medieval period to an extent uh, after the after the Anglo-Norman conquest in the 13th century, and Owain Glyndwr actually used the system of Cantrevi to organise his rebellion in the 15th century, in the first decade of the 15th century. So it's a very long-lived system. Within the Cantrevi, or actually before we move on to that, there is a famous Cantrev, Mana Cantrev Enwogiawn, uh, Nghymriach and Llenyddiaeth Gymraeg. Uh, in Welsh literature we have Cantred Gwaelod, uh, if you've not heard of Cantred Gwaelod, Cantred Gwaelod is a classic Welsh myth, uh, the moral of which is pay attention to what you're doing because uh, Cantred Gwaelod is the Welsh Atlantis, it's the, it's the Brythonic Atlantis, and the story goes that many, many years ago in the dim and distant past, uh, Cantred Gwaelod was protected from the sea by sea walls and a floodgate, and one day uh, one of the lords of Cantred Gwaelod falls asleep at the floodgate, uh, the sea starts coming in, he goes and rings the church bell, because uh, it's a long time ago, but still fully Christianized, so sub-Roman, possibly? And the sea washes in, some people manage to escape, but he drowns, I think. <laughs> Somebody always dies in Welsh legends, and uh, Cantred Gwaelod is swallowed up by the sea, never to be seen again. Um, though presumably only at high tide, but we're not going to pick it apart, okay? And um, yeah, the story goes that if you're somewhere on the west coast, let's say Aberystwyth, if you're in Aberystwyth uh, at night, you might hear the bells of Cantred Gwaelod from the sea. Uh, but when I was there last weekend, all I could hear was the roaring of the waves and the hooting of people enjoying the comedy festival, which was very nice. Um, so yeah, Cantred Gwaelod. And all the, uh, all the stories that you hear, all the times I've heard the story told, it's been, oh yeah, it was a village that was lost by the sea. But it's not a village, is it? It's a Cantrev, it's a hundred, full, fully a hundred settlements. Um, so thousands of people drowned. Horrible. Um, that's a full landscape. That's like a, a full biome. Anyway, Cantre uh, is obviously therefore still used in, in telling this legend, in telling this myth, this tale. Uh, and some of the names of the Cantrevi still exist. In fact, a lot of the names of the Cantrevi uh, still exist. Um, Arvon is the Cantrev that I come from. I come from Arvon. Uh, and you've probably heard of Cairn Arvon, the fortress in Arvon. Carnarvon Castle is one of the biggest castles in Wales. Really cool, used to work there. And the name was still used now as an administrative area in the county of Gwynedd, Arvon is part of the county of Gwynedd, so it effectively acts as a subdivision of the county. Um, and you see that all over Wales, I've, I've put a map on the screen so you can have a look and, and, and enjoy, compare and contrast some of these uh, modern county subdivisions with the medieval Cymudai. And we know a lot of the names, Magpie, of these Cymudai uh, and Cantrevi because the 13th century, the 14th century Llyfr uh, Hergest, the Red Book of Hergest, has a huge long list of them. Here's some of them. And we know that these are reorganised periodically, the boundaries change every now and then, uh, the boundaries are often uh, geographical and topographical features, so rivers, mountains, hillsides, forests, and so on. Sometimes they're boundaries between linguistic dialects. Um, in Wales now we have North, North Welsh, uh, Canolbarth, Central Welsh, and South Welsh. Within that we have um, Sirgar, we have places like Carmarthenshire, we have Cardiff, we have uh, the Llyn, the Llyn Peninsula, we have um, and it's Morn, uh, we have Eruri, all of these different places with their own dialects of Welsh. And it was the same one and a half thousand years ago. All of these places had separate little dialects of the language of Middle Welsh. Within those Cantrevi, as I've just been wittering on about, we have Cymudai, um, which is the plural of the Welsh word Cymud, uh, which gives the English word 
Comet. Uh, Comet is a subdivision of a cantref. So you have one cumud dai gamut dai. Well, in cumud dai gamut or dai or gamut dai. I love Welsh. Anyway, such cool language. Much more than today. Anyway, um, yeah, he's got a beard. Yeah, he's an A cumud is a theoretical half of a cantref. So. 50 settlements, 50 farmsteads, 50 extended families. The system of Kumutai starts to be really important in the early medieval period, so sub-Roman and, and beyond. And um, the Kumud is used for similar purposes to the Kantrev, and later on the Kumud becomes more important in some places than the Kantrev, the idea of the Kumud court. So, Shisa Gumud becomes more important than Shisa Gantrev. Um, the main town where this Gantrev court would take place was called a Meir Drev, a major town, which is where the word Meir, mayor of a town, now comes from. Same Latin root, obviously, Maior. Um, and as an example of this subdivision of land, it's basically, think of it as like um, a council a councillor's ward within a county council if you like or like uh, a county within a state um or province for my north american friends um so i am from the dinas the city of bangor which is in the kumud of east gwirvai lower gwirvai uh, which is in the cantrev of arvon which is in the kingdom of Gwynedd. So I am from all of that. That's where I'm from. Um, and you can go deeper if you really want to, um, from the neighbourhood that you're from. And I am a Sipol, so that will tell you where I'm from. But um, within that, there was a little detail. I said I was from Lower Gwyrfai, East Gwyrfai, and there is an Iwch Gwyrfai. The river Gwyrfai separates the two. And you get a lot of Kumatai in early medieval Wales that has is and ilch separating, so if you have a lower and an upper. Um, and it's caused lots of argument about why that is when some of them are lower and they're called ilch and some of them are higher and they're called is. And it always seemed fairly obvious to me after I studied Roman provincial naming um, conventions that it was like the Roman way of doing it because lower somewhere was closer to Rome than upper somewhere or uh, somewhere superior was closer than somewhere inferior. Super somewhere was further away than supra somewhere. Um, and almost always, almost uniformly, the administrative centre uh, was in the is kumud rather than the ilch kumud of the Kantrev. Um, which for me, for our purposes, is uh, either Canarvon or Bangor, depending on when we're talking about. So. The administrative centre of the Kantrev is in the East Kumud, is in the Lower Kumud. Clear as mud? Thought it might be. Um, these naming conventions survive today. Many of the places that we've talked about still have those names, at least when we talk about them in a more formal or in a governmental or in a traditional sense, which is very important in Welsh culture. Um, the cat is having a lovely play. And the actual the use of the Kumud system survives the Norman invasions of the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries to an extent. In the Doomsday Book, we have places referred to as comets rather than hundreds or hides of land. And many of these Kumutai were separated into uh, parcels that were... There's a word for it, and I can't, it's a really clever word, and I can't remember the word. Editing Jimmy will put it on the screen, but it's the amount of land a team of eight oxen can plough in a season, um, which is a very sensible way of separating land down. Um, and we have boundary stones, we have, I mean, we've got hundreds and hundreds of, of uninscribed boundary stones um, that help us to map some of these places. The Royal Commission for Ancient and Historic Monuments in Wales and the University of Wales have an amazing deep mapping project. And they've done, a, they've done a, an initial segment in North East Wales, I think in Denbyshire and Sir Dimbych. Uh, and it's absolutely astonishing 
how many field boundaries up there are like a thousand years old. It's amazing how these demarcated boundaries just survive because they work, because it is the fertile part of the bit of the valley that people live in, and it just stays that way forever. It's amazing. It's like the houses in York that I mentioned that are on plots that the Vikings laid down, uh, down on the shambles. It, it's so cool. Um, so yeah, check out, I'll link to that actually, I'll link to that, so check that out. And also, if you're interested in the inscribed stones that we've got in Wales, uh, a sizable minority of which are boundary stones, check out their, their three-volume magnum opus, um, the, the corpus of early medieval inscribed stones in Wales. It's absolutely superb. Um, so that is land boundaries. I've managed to talk about them for 15 minutes, and I don't know how, um, but yeah, thank you for sticking with if you've stuck with. I hope that's been a little, just an interesting introduction to you. Uh, and we can go into things like um, the system of Hissoi, the, the courts, and, and uh, the circular nature of courts, because there was a king, of course, for every kingdom, uh, or a prince for every, for every uh, principality, um, or petty kingdom, and they, they did traditionally go on circuits, so they went around, they went around their kingdom, they paraded around, and would stay at different Maer Drevi, they would stay in different Cantrevi, and different Cymatai, um, and hold court and dispense justice um, at a higher level. Uh, you know, who who polices the policeman? It's the king. So these Ichelwyr in their courts, in these Cantrevi, would then have the king come and visit them, probably annually, maybe more than annually, maybe three times a year, come and visit and say, all right, let's sort some stuff out at a higher level. You know, how, 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 who many, who, how many people do I have to condemn to death this time, lads? Um, that all helps with things like taxation and warfare, because if you are taxing people in kind, which we think was the the way that they did it in early medieval Wales, um, certainly that they don't seem to have had a coin-based economy when the Romans leave, they seem to have reverted to payment in kind, uh, so crops and livestock and butter and cheese and booze and that kind of stuff. Um, it helps to have smaller decentralised government, and the beauty of this is it, it is decentralised. Yeah, you've got a king, the king has his own court, but that court is in a cantrev, and it's just one of many cantrevi, right? There's, there's loads of the bloody things, and the king goes around each of them, he tours around, he's not always in his castle. And it's beautiful, everybody gets to see the king. Sorry, my memory card was full, so I had to delete a couple of previous takes. Anyway, uh, we see things like largesse being dispensed by kings when they travel around, and by queens as well, uh, when they travel around. Uh, and these are codified by Hoeldar's laws in the 9th century, and, and he says how much cloth you give to your courtiers on Whitsuntide, and, and you know how much your brewer, your court brewer, is allowed uh, to skim off the top, uh, how big the slush fund is for your court chef, that kind of thing. In warfare, you can mobilise easier. You can say um, the cantrev of Arlechwev has to mobilise against a raiding party attacking them at Apergwyn uh, You can say, I need three cummuds worth of troops to muster and march to uh, the Cumud of Aperfrau on an Morn, that kind of thing. You can, you can easily uh, administer, and if you have a decent system of census, which they may have, uh, we're not sure as far as I'm aware, then it makes administration of your, of your kingdom a fairly straightforward process. And that, my friends, is why we have administrative divisions in countries, um, because you can control populations easier that way. Um, I, I, I am an advocate for decentralization in a lot of ways. I think it, it helps a lot of people in a lot of ways. But uh, yeah, that is the, the strange decentralized courts and cumud system of early medieval Wales. I hope you found that an interesting, slightly waffly little first dip. Uh, we can talk more about Welsh medieval legislation, and I'm going to because it's fascinating. Um, the Welsh system of, of compensation for bodily injury and that kind of stuff is great. Um, so yeah, diolch yn iawn am ranto. Thank you very much for listening to me waffle on about uh, cymydau and, and llysoedd and uh, cantrefi and cantref gwylod. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you to all my patrons as usual. Thanks to everybody who's sent me notes and letters and emails, as I said at the start. Um, 
you're all amazing uh, and I, I apologize for not being so active recently it's been a tough old time more on that in a, in a future vid but yeah have a lovely time and Tantranissa who will vow till the next time bye bye Yeah.